Gracious God, we are thankful for this beautiful day. We're thankful that you brought us together here today. For some reason, you called me here today, and you called everybody that's sitting here in this beautiful sanctuary. You called us here together today for, for a reason that maybe we don't understand. A long journey maybe has brought us here to this point, to this day. Whatever the reason, we give you thanks. And we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to what's happening here in this place. And send your son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. By the time we get to this Palm Sunday, and this part of the Gospel of John, a theme is prevalent. And that is that not much has changed. Not much has changed with the crowds that have followed, who have come, who have gone, who have reappeared around the teaching and miracle work of Jesus the Christ. We come to this pivotal chapter in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. It's a hinge. It's a door that is open that points Jesus towards Jerusalem. And as we read the passage before and after what Patty read for us, the passages before and after, we discover that not much has changed. There's still questions about the origins of Christ. There's questions about his authority. There's questions about the signs that he has performed. There's questions about who is this son of man? Questions abound from insiders, those who are of um, the Jewish faith and who are understanding um, their faith through the eyes of the Torah and the prophets. There's questions by the outsiders, and the Roman authorities, and those outside of the faith, but questions nonetheless. I'm going to read a passage as we back up in the gospel just to illustrate the point that not much has changed. If we just back up a few um, chapters to chapter 8. I'm going to start with verse 12. Chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people again, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I'll stop there just for a second. Not only has not much changed with the crowds, not much has changed with what the Gospel of John is trying to articulate. From the very beginning to the very end, we hear this division between darkness and what? Darkness and light. So it's a theme over and over again, and we have it here in this Palm Sunday reading as well. Picking up the verses, then the Pharisees said to him, see, nothing much has changed. Because you are testifying about yourself, your testimony is not valid. And so the Pharisees are questioning his authority. Not much has changed. Jesus replied, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. Since I know where I came from and where I'm going, not much has changed with that. The origins of Christ from the very beginning, when we had that um, that making the water and the wine, we talked about one of the signs pointing towards the glory of God is this idea of the origins. Where is Christ coming from? And so this passage lifts that up. You don't know where I'm coming from or where I'm going. You judge according to human standards, but I judge no one. Even if I do judge, my judgment is truthful because I'm not alone. My judgments come from me and from the Father who sent me. Again, the origins and who's, who's being sent and from whom. Not much has changed there. In your law it is written that the witness of two people is true. I am one witness concerning myself and the Father who sent me is the other. And so we have this dialogue right here in the middle of the book of Signs, chapter 8. And, and we can see not much has changed. And even if we back up to the first miracle story, that started all this for us, the changing of water to wine. Um, just an example of how these signs uh, work and the responses they usher in. Uh, after the changing of the water to the wine, we have Jesus 
um, heading into Jerusalem the first time, and he's having this conversation uh, with the Jewish leaders starting in verse 18. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous signs will you show? So again, you know, from the very beginning of this gospel, those questions are there, and they're going to be the core of the argument, the core of the conflict, trying to answer these questions about who is this Jesus guy and where is he coming from? And so by the time we get to this hinge chapter, chapter 12, where he's making his way towards Jerusalem, um, the old saying, as much as things change, they what? They stay the same. And so we have, uh, in this case, more questions, more conflict is heating up. And so not much has changed. What we've done together uh, for the last um, month and a half is we've looked at uh, the signs of the Gospel of John. I think we skipped one. Uh, but the signs, so through all these signs, through all these symbols, all these miracles that Jesus has been working through and out and with, uh, pointing towards the glory of God, uh, you know, we've looked at them one by one. The, the first miracle that came at the wedding, water to wine, then the curing of the official's uh, son, the curing of the paralyzed man at the bath, and then the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water is the one I think we skipped. And then uh, healing the blind man. And then finally, the last straw was the raising of Lazarus. The raising of Lazarus. And so we've had all of these signs, all of these miracles that have been pointing us towards the glory of God, giving us hints, giving us a taste of the glory of God. And all along the way, some folks have responded in a positive way, and they've been attracted to these symbols and these signs. Others, it just raised the level of conflict and question about the authority of Jesus. But all along the way, it's been the same story. It's been almost like a broken record in terms of the response. And so nothing much has changed. And now when we get to this chapter of Jesus, his entry into Jerusalem, uh, the whole chapter through, again, we see the same themes of light and darkness, of uh, uh, death and life, of uh, um, good and evil, basically, insiders and outsiders. I'll draw you to uh, verse 30 in chapter 12. And so this is a little bit beyond uh, what was read for us. Jesus is in another conversation. Um, with the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And he replies uh, about the voice that was just heard from his Father in heaven. This wasn't for my benefit, but for yours. Now is the time for judgment of this world. Now this world's ruler will be thrown out. When I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. And he said this to show how he was going to die. And so now we have... Um, this conflict. Uh, and then the Pharisees respond. So now, so now Jesus again, he's been heading towards the fact that he had to be lifted up, and that would be where he uh, where God's glory was revealed. And now he says it specifically and explicitly. Um, and now the Pharisees respond in 34. The crowd responded, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the human one must be lifted up? Who is this human one? So it's the same question from the very beginning. It's the same question from the very beginning of this book. And they're asking, how can this be? It doesn't match up with what we know. It doesn't match up with what we know. It's supposed to be in terms of the Messiah. So these religious leaders are hung up on what they know and what they expect and what they have learned all along the way, and they have missed God's glory through all of these signs that we've talked about. I hesitate to ask, but may we get the picture up on the screen that is <laughs> All right, all right. This is a Rembrandt, an, etch, an etching. And Jesus is there in the background. 
And what I would like to point out is on the lowest part of the screen, there's actually, and you're not going to be able to see it very well just because of the copy, but there's a little boy who is laying in the dust, dirt, and he's drawing in the dirt. The little arrow is pointing, the cursor is pointing on the little boy. Thank you. And so everybody is listening intently on Jesus, and this little boy seems to be oblivious to the glory of God in the room, which is Jesus the Christ. And so I raised that, we showed that, to say that that boy is not much different than the crowds that have been following Jesus from one sign to the other, from the wedding at Cana to the healing at Cana to the feeding of the 5,000, to the walking of water, the calming of the sea. Jesus has been revealing himself and the glory of God all along the way, yet people seem to be oblivious. God is in their presence through the work and the teachings and the life of Jesus the Christ, and they might as well be this little boy playing in the dirt. They miss it over and over and over Again, they missed it seven times so far in the Gospel of John. They've had a complete opportunity to see the glory of God, and they miss it. And one of the major reasons the religious leaders of the day, of the first century, miss that Jesus is the Messiah, they miss it because of what they know. They miss it because of what knowledge they have acquired from little bitty boys like that. And they've grown up in the synagogue, they've grown up in the Torah, they've grown up with the prophets, they've grown up with their grandparents teaching them about the coming Messiah, and it does not match up to what they know with their head that the Messiah is supposed to be. And so they miss it regardless of how many signs and miracles and teachings Jesus does in their presence. They're oblivious because it doesn't match up to what they know. The mystery of God doesn't match up with what they know. They have no room in the first century for the mystery of God's miracles. They have no room for signs from God that don't match up word for word with the way they understand the Torah and the prophets. And so they miss the glory of God in their presence. In their presence. And so they continue to question the origins of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, his relationship with the Father, his relationship with the poor, his relationship with the prophets, his relationship as they navigate first century politics and economics. They miss it. They have a longing to see the world in black and white. Not much has changed. They've been consistent with that all along. And in fact, from the beginning of time, that's what the human has wanted. They've wanted to know. They've wanted to know. That's the first sin in the garden. What's the first sin in the garden? Basically, they were seeking out what? Eating the apple because what was it going to give them? Knowledge. Knowledge. Now, before we go too far, don't go home and throw away your Bibles. Quit reading. Because we don't want to pursue knowledge. That's ridiculous. But sometimes our pursuit of knowledge, especially pursuit of knowledge in the black and white, to want to know for sure without a shadow of a doubt, can be a barrier to us understanding, or at least experiencing, the mystery and the presence of God. Because we can find ourselves, if we're not too careful, just as these Pharisees and religious leaders are, if we don't watch ourselves, we can be blinded by what we know about God. We can be so blinded by what we think we know, let me say it that way, that we can miss the miracles and the signs in our midst. We can be oblivious, just like this kid on the floor, to God working around us, because it doesn't quite match up to what we thought we knew. We have to make room as Christians the mystery of the way God operates. If we don't make room for that, we can miss big time signs and miracles. Big time signs and miracles. 
Not much has changed since this story of Jesus moving into Jerusalem and the people missing it. Just as an aside, Jesus, one time in the Gospel stories, writes something down. One time he writes something down. Can, you, can anybody remember what medium he used? Did he use a computer? Dirt. That can be easily what? Wiped away. Wiped away. We want to lock God and Jesus up in these boxes based on the Jesus we've created. We all, everyone in here, 100% of us, 100% of us, have created a Jesus that we follow. 100% of us have created a Jesus that we follow. And 100% of us um, don't get it right. 100% of us are wrong in the Jesus that we've created. Amen? I mean, don't be not sure, sure what I'm saying, right? Right. We should be on a pursuit of following Jesus. That's correct. And we're, it's a lifelong journey to try to figure out who Jesus is and how we fit in the Jesus story. But we've all constructed a Jesus to fit what we need from Jesus. And it starts from the very beginning. Our, you know, we learn about Jesus in Sunday school. We learn about Jesus from our grandparents. We learn about Jesus from the preacher. We learn about Jesus from whatever material we have available to us. And we mold and we shape Jesus all along the way. And shape our image of God based on this Jesus that we've created all along the way. And then as our life changes, guess what? We change our Jesus to fit our life. Now let me hear an amen. Amen. I mean, just imagine yourself as an um, 1860 slaveholder in the South. And you're a great person, man or woman, of God. And you're constantly trying to figure out, how do I survive in this economy? How do I survive in this political situation and still live out my faith? And so you're a slaveholder and you shape a Jesus that works within your slaveholder. Amen? You're a politician like Thomas Jefferson, who I love because of his University of Virginia. I have a degree from the University of Virginia. And you have to sign a statement that you love Thomas Jefferson before they'll let you in. <laughs> but Thomas Jefferson, great forefather, awesome for our country. Man of God, he not only shaped the Jesus to fit his politics and his life, he shaped the Bible. He tore out pages of the Bible that didn't fit with the Jesus that he had created. And you don't believe it, you can find it. It's touring the country. It's a Smithsonian artifact. He literally tore out pages of the Bible to make sure that his Jesus fit what he was the way he was trying to live out his life. It's exactly the reasons why people will miss the glory of God because we've constructed this Jesus. We've constructed this Jesus to fit and to change as we change. And then we miss the miracles and the signs God's putting right in front of us. And the problem of that is it's backwards. It's backwards. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Jesus doesn't change. We are the ones that are supposed to change as we go forward. And Jesus doesn't change. We constantly put ourselves up and against this Jesus that is constant. And so we get 10 years down the road. We don't form and reform Jesus to fit where we are. We say, where am I compared to the Jesus that was the same 10 years ago? And that is an effective way for living out your faith. And these Pharisees, these religious leaders, the crowds couldn't do that. And so they miss, they miss the glory of God being revealed to them right in their midst. And not just the Pharisees 
and the Jewish leaders of the day, but the crowd that's waving the palms and excited to usher Jesus in, it's only going to take them a few days, a few days to be changing their hosannas to crucify him, to crucify him. And they're going to mold and shape and say, no, this Jesus, after all, doesn't fit the Messiah that I've constructed in my mind. And so it's a very dangerous place to be. Not much has changed. We desperately, desperately as human beings want to see things. And we want to know fully and complete. We want to know in black and white. We want to know steps one through five on how to pursue this thing called our faith in Christ. And we don't want to leave anything to chance. And it's precisely when we do that. We fall right into this chapter as the bad guys. And we miss opportunities to feel the presence of God because we have no room in our skulls for the mystery of God. Part of our faith is mystery, and we need to claim that. It's a mystery. We don't have to understand fully why lifting Christ up on the cross is a good thing, not a bad thing. Why did Christ have to die before he rose again? We don't have to understand. It's a mystery how all that works. The only thing we have to know for sure is that we have faith that what Jesus did was for us. And then when Jesus says, I will draw all people to me by being raised up on the cross, we believe in that. That's the only thing we have to know. And we know it more with our heart than we do with our head. And then we'll be opening ourselves up to see not just the mysteries of God, but the miracles of God. And so my prayer for me today and for all of you is that we won't be so hard-headed. We won't be chasing after so much knowledge of facts. We won't be chasing after memorizing so many verses and people's names in the Bibles that we block ourselves from the mysteries of God that are happening right now when we go outside of this place today. So that's my prayer for myself and for you. That we can come out of this this week not being on the side that yells crucified, but holding steadfast to our belief that Jesus is the Messiah and that we can shout Hosanna all through Holy Week, leading us to the empty tomb when we gather again next Sunday. It's a mystery. And we can claim that and we can celebrate that together. If we're not parasitic in our faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.